the waste imported by Indonesia from Europe uh, and from other countries are not 100% recycled. Um, among the shipments, probably only 40 to 50% being really recycled by companies, either by plastic manufacturers or paper companies. Um, but the rest of the shipment will be dumped in the communities, in the villages, or in empty places. Uh, or some companies will donate the unwanted plastics to the communities. And the communities who, get, who receive these donations, they will separate it and then they will sell um, recyclables that still have values, but the rest of them will be burned by them. So, because they don't have waste management system, they don't have waste collection. So to provide spaces for the next drop, they will burn the piles and that created um, pollution in the air, in the soil, and in the water. The actual health risk for the communities are um, air pollution affecting their respiratory problems, their respiratory system, and then also in their water, the surface water, the, the river, got polluted by microplastics uh, from the waste that flying around and also being burned. Um, and the communities also have risk from the contaminated soil because when they burn the plastics, the ashes also stay on the ground and that also affecting their uh, chicken and their, their pets and uh, the cows that live around their areas. Um, our uh, studies with Arnica shows that uh, in the chicken eggs that found or collected from the houses nearby that areas, um, we found high concentrations of dioxins. I don't think they know the risk of their work because what they need is money for that day. Uh, many people who separated the waste, uh, imported waste, um, are relying on a daily wage or, or from selling the recyclables. So they don't really know the impact or the effect of burning waste to their health. They only wanted to get the wire from the cables or um, uh, the metals from uh, the shipments that are wanted by paper company or plastic companies. So they just need money for that day. So there are two types of workers. Um, the workers who work with the company, with the formal company, um, they, they will keep the job because they keep them busy. Uh, because the waste need to be separated and so on. Um, but if the companies um, do not follow or do not comply with regulations, there are risks for them to lose their job because the companies will be shut down. Um, the second group are people who do the business informally. So they are informal recyclers like um, the people that you see in the pictures, they separated the waste in front of their houses. Um, when the waste imported um, has been controlled or regulated, they look for another sources now from domestic waste. So they, they always try to find uh, the replacement of their works um, and they, they find a way how to deal with it. Although some of them admitted that their income was less now because they, we have less imported waste now um, and the price or the quality of the waste from abroad, from Europe, from America are better than the domestic waste. So that's how they said that they lose some money or they do not have, they do not earn as before.
when we talk to some people, some communities and the villagers, uh, some of them are very resistant. They don't like us, so they shoo us away with machete. Um, the cameraman also being threatened um, because they do not want us to disturb their businesses. And they also understood that media or journalists, especially with camera, uh, most likely will tell the world or tell the story about how, how dirty the business is. Um, but uh, some communities who got uh, affected, especially those with children, uh, they talk to us, they're willing to share their concerns and so on. And then they, they felt that they were treated badly by their neighbors because the one who polluted the environment is not the companies, but they see it's their neighbors. How can they fight their neighbors? How can they, you know, um, had a big fight with the neighbors because it's their incomes too. So some of the communities decided to move out from that village as the consequences because they do not want to have a fight first. The second, they want to avoid the, uh, the pollution. So they never talk about injustice in, in, a, in a proper term or in, in a conversation, but they felt that they were polluted by their neighbors. Uh, they didn't realize that they were actually polluted or contaminated by the company. But what they see is the right, the person, the immediate person that polluting the environments are their neighbors. So they blame the neighbors. Um, the injustice feeling probably only um, felt by some people who lost their businesses and so on because of the plastic waste importation. In Indonesia, only one incinerator, waste incinerator, waste to energy plant uh, in operation at the moment. Um, there are some of uh, some others still on uh, ongoing or uh, under construction, um, but this one uh, is considered as a pilot. Um, pilot uh, built by an agency for technology assessment and. Uh, uh, application. But the way they handle the ash is just, you know, they piling up um, all the ashes by the fence. And we collected the samples when we visited. It it's shows dioxins, although it's not high, but it's, it's the dioxin is there, um, probably about 15 times or 20 times of the safe level, um, according to the limit of Indonesia. So by having that uh, kind of results, we share it, we presented it to the government that the myth that incinerators solve the problem is not right because they create another problem. So it's not the problem solver, but they create another problem, which is more dangerous because we can't see it because it's in the air and then in the ash, um, people cannot see it. Um, so now we are in the process of discussing the results with them and hopefully uh, they will change the regulations and the policy to support incinerators. Um, we have another challenge now coming up, not only incinerations of waste, but the refuse derived fuel. So that's residuals of waste that cannot be sent to the landfill or that it should be land, sent to the landfill, but because the landfill is full, now they convert it into pellets or briquettes and then burn it in the cement kiln or in a coal-fired power plant. So that's also another uh, myth that um, we thought that it's not right because you only uh, change the shape of the problem into something new and uh, it's more dangerous. Yeah, first, I think it's um, what the EU uh, countries or government can help uh, developing countries. Uh, there are several uh, ideas. The first one is to support, increase the capacity of the government in developing countries to understand 
uh, the toxic issues and also to understand more how to monitor uh, the emissions and releases from activities that potentially release uh, toxic uh, substances. And uh, the second is to support um, the capacity building of laboratory in uh, developing countries because the, the unavailability of laboratory make less research conducted. It means we don't have evidence or information to fit the policy uh, making process. So if we have more laboratories in Indonesia uh, or in other developing countries with the capacity to analyze POPs, especially POPs waste, um, that will help the country to develop their policy based on evidence or, or science-backed uh, uh, policy. And the third, as individuals, um, I think it's, it's important to um, rethink when you do shopping, because if you know where your waste ended up, um, you will start thinking about uh, the essential things that you buy or you need. Um, and uh, separations of waste doesn't mean recycling. Um, so you have to really understand what kind of packaging can be recycled, what cannot be recycled. Do not put the non-recyclables into the separated bins because it will be separated and then packed and shipped to other countries. Um, so awareness uh, of individuals in uh, EU countries will help a lot um, the communities in the developing countries.